Hello, and welcome to Tech Talks in 10. My name is Mike Mangino. I'm a consulting engineer with Nokia's IP division. Today, I'm here to talk to you about eVPN multi-homing and how it can help replace traditional L2 Ethernet technologies to help you build a more scalable and survivable network. These technologies have been developed to help enhance eVPN solutions while still maintaining backward compatibility with legacy Ethernet switching. Legacy data center switching networks use lag bundling and spanning tree for redundancy and survivability during failures. As we move from these technologies and start using a BGP control plane for these networks, we need to have new tools in the toolbox to help provide the same or better level of redundancy. So a bit of an agenda. First, we're gonna talk about terminology and concepts. We're gonna talk about the different modes of operation for eVPN multi-homing, whether it be single active or all active. We're gonna talk about signaling. We're gonna talk about discovery, DF election, and handling of the different traffic types. What are those? They're broadcast, known unicast, and then we're gonna talk about failure scenarios on top of that. Terminology and main concepts. There are always new acronyms to learn in every technology. And most people know the terminology of uh, the PE and the CE. These are the DMARC devices at the provider edge and customer edge of the network, respectively. We have an ESI, or the Ethernet Segment Identifier. The ESI is the attachment circuit into the eVPN from the PE to the CE. We have a broadcast domain, which is a BD or MAC BRF. We have an EVI, eVPN instance, DF, or designated forwarder, NDF, non-designated forwarder. Then we have an Ethernet segment and virtual Ethernet segment. These are the links that connect the CE to the PE, and the Ethernet segment identifier is unique across the network. You can have up to four PEs per ES, and an ES on a PE can contain a lag port, MPLS tunnel, pseudowire, VLAN, Q and Q tag combinations, or even a VXLAN instance. The ES is defined in RFC 7432 BGP MPLS-based Ethernet VPN, and the virtual ES is defined in draft best Ethernet, uh, EVPN virtual Ethernet segment. Single active mode is multi-homed, but you have one active PE at a time. Lag or pseudo wire to the CE is uh, required. In all active multi-home, you can have two or more PEs up to four, and lag to the CE is required. In eVPN, we really do have the ultimate multi-homing solution. Whether it be physical links or virtual, automated or full manual control, you can choose. The drafts that were mentioned on the last slide deal with two very important aspects of multi-homing, connectivity between the PE and CE, and how we deal with broadcast unknown multicast traffic, i.e. loop avoidance in these networks. Virtual Ethernet segments, the draft best that we talked about before, really talk about the association between the eVPN and any tunnels, VLANs, or any other virtual interface, rather than the physical and how they are supported in the various service types, whether it be you know, VPWS, etc. In RFC 8584, that's the framework for Ethernet VPN designated forwarder election. We can have an automatic or service carving uh, load balancing scenario. We can have manually provisioned load balancing, and we can do preference based with a non-revertive option in the event of, that the primary circuit comes back. So in all active scenarios, we have re some required procedures for loop avoidance. The designated forwarders are responsible for this, and it could be compared in function of the concept of a root bridge and spanning tree. The DF election helps us avoid duplicate bum flooding to, in all active CE scenarios, because the DF is the one responsible for the bum flooding into the ethernet segment. Split horizon ensures that the broadcast traffic sent to the non-DF is not replicated back onto the ethernet segment. Aliasing allows load balancing to the PEs that are part of the ESI, meaning we can provide per service load balancing in single active and all active scenarios. There are also some required procedures uh, for single home uh, deployments. You know, back when we had VPLS, um, you know, it, our previous L2 uh, technology of choice, we learned some lessons that help, have really helped us to increase scalability. In a multi-homing VPLS, individual MAC flush messages had to be sent per service in order to flush the MACs on the remote PEs. The total convergence time would grow with a number of services, and the MAC flush would, would create a subsequent flooding as a MAC address learning had to occur. 
In single active multi-homing EVPN, a mass withdrawal message is sent for all the services in the ESI. Total convergence time is uniform for all services, and there's no need to wait for individual MACs to be withdrawn, and there's no flooding. So, for ES discovery and DF election, how does this work? An ESI is provisioned and advertised in an ES route. The ES route is not associated to a service, but to the base instance. For the DF election, there's a DF candidate list built of the PE IPs for each EVI identifier, that is, each service contained in the, eth in the Ethernet segment. The DF election can be non-revertive if the DF algorithm is preference-based. The candidate list per EVI can be modified based on the operational status of the access interface or pseudo-wire. That's uh, attachment circuit influence DF election. So what happens during normal operation? The DF unblocks the uh, transmit-receive on the ES for all the services where ESI1 is defined. The NDF uh, in single active blocks transmit and receive on the ESI for all services. In all active, it removes ESI1 from the flooding list for all services. Signaling. We need to signal the presence of the Ethernet segment with auto-derived routes. Auto-derived per ES routes advertise the ES capabilities. There can be more than one EVI on a given ES. And the PEs advertise an ESI label for split horizon and mode, whether they're all active or single active. There could be a mi mixture of redundancy models based on the SLA per service. If the AD per ES route is withdrawn, it, act, it impacts the DF election candidate list and mass withdrawal procedures. An AD per EVI route advertises the ES association to a given service. An alias list is built for all active or whether the route is primary or backup for single active. The withdrawal of an AD per EVI route has the you know has impact on the DF election candidate list again and aliasing or primary backup list. So for bum forwarding, assuming ingress replication, which is the way this works, bum traffic from a CE may get to the DF or NDF and is ingress replicated to the remote PEs. In this case, the NDF does not send any bum frames into the ESI. The designated forwarder doesn't send bum frames with its own ESI label into the ESI, meaning traffic received on the ES from other sources doesn't get replicated again. Bum traffic from CE1 only makes it to the DF and is if bum traffic from CE1 only makes it to the DF and is ingress replicated to the remote PEs, NDF doesn't send any frames into the ESI. And again, the DF doesn't send bum frames with its own ESI label into the ESI. So for known unicast forwarding, unicast flows are alias to PE1 and PE2. CE1 MAC is associated to ESI1 with an RT2 route, and PE4 knows it's all active. PE4 hashes the ingress flows and picks a next stop for the ESI for a given flow, and the unicast flows are sent to the DF. CE1 MAC is associated to ESI1, so PE4 knows it's single active. PE4 installs only one primary next stop for ES1 based on the MAC route's next stop. So failure scenarios. This is where it gets interesting. A failure on PE3, whether it be an ES link or a node or the service access point, PE3 is removed from PE4's next stop list for the ESI. As soon as the AD per ES or per EVI withdrawal is received, if there's an AD per ESI withdrawal received first, it'll remove PE3 next hop for all the services. And PE2 becomes a DF. A failure on PE3 on the transport side or any of the above, the PE3 is removed as primary next hop and the backup next hop is used. And if an AD per ESI uh, withdrawal is received first, it'll remove PE3 again for all the services. Again, PE2 becomes a designated forwarder and there's no MAC flush, as long as the MAC route is still active, unless there are more than two PEs in ESI1. So what's next? Well, I'd really like to thank you for your time today and hope that this information was helpful. For more information on eVPN technologies and use cases, please see the links on the slide or contact your Nokia representative.